Shabbat shalom, every, Shabbat shalom, everybody. This is Rabbi Stephen Rashbi, Rab, Rabbi Shmuel Ben Yehoshua, with you with this week's uh, ten minute Torah, this week's uh, portion. So, um, hope you're doing well. I had the honor and the pleasure of officiating at a bar mitzvah uh, this past week, and actually, it was more like a b'nai mitzvah. It's like the whole family got involved. The young man becoming thirteen and his parents had approached me a couple of months ago, I mean, two months to prepare for a bar mitzvah. So we decided to do it uh, in the evening with a what's called a mincha marif. And the mincha is, <coughs> excuse me, the afternoon service. Um, so on Shabbat, and this was Ezra the scribe years and years and years ago, decided that we should have an additional Torah service on Saturday afternoon to keep Israelites out of trouble from defiling the Shabbat, give them, keep them busy. Uh, we also had one on Mondays and Thursdays. And in that service, in that Torah service, there was only three aliyot, Kohen, Levi, and uh, Israel. So it was kind of a short reading. And afternoon, in the afternoon of Shabbat, the portion is now next week's portion. So Saturday, Monday, and Thursday, it's a short portion, portion short reading. It's usually the first aliyah of the portion of the Shabbat, of the full portion that's done on Shabbat. And it's kind of a way to kind of warm up to the full portion. It's just kind of a little taste of it. And people do that type of a bar mitzvah. Some people do, especially with only two months to coordinate with uh, a couple of graduations as well and make it one big, um, one big event. So, um, it was basically a few verses and, uh, the person, the young man handled it very well. And, it was great and very proud of him. Additionally, something I didn't, I neglected to mention last week, but a lot of people know that I was ordained in New York City oh, just about seven years ago now, by the end of June, at a seminary, a private seminary called Rabbinical Seminary International. Well, I found out about a week and a half ago that one of the deans, Rabbi Jill Hauser, who was also the rabbi at the uh, Actors Temple in New York, and the actor's place, which uh, is what they used to refer to as Hell's Kitchen, but a very, very beautiful temple. And some of you that have seen pictures from my ordination see just how beautiful it was. And um, it's got a very nice history. She was on Saturday Night Live. It was during the weekend update segment where they had the two guys going back and forth. Now, I haven't seen it in a while, so I'm not familiar with the names. Michael Che and I forget the other guy's name. But they were doing some Jewish jokes with each other, and Rabbi Jill was there as kind of, and she was all decked out in her yarmulke and Natali, and she was there as kind of like the censor, you know, to monitor the, um, what do you call it, the um, chaperone, if you will, that would grimace every time there was kind of a bad joke, and uh, it was a surprise to me, it was beautiful, so um, mazel tov to Rabbi Jill for representing us on TV, you did great, thank you very much. Okay, let's talk about this week's portion. And it is Nasa, princes. There's a lot going on in this portion. Uh, of course, we do the triennial cycle. We're in triennial year two now, which is typically, not always, but typically the middle third of that particular portion. And the two um, topics that fall under this triennial cycle is the Sota and the Nazarite. So this portion talks about the duties of the Levite clans. There were three clans, Ger uh, Gershon, Merari, and Kohath, that would be responsible for um, transporting the various parts of the Mishkan. Somebody had the furniture, somebody had the uh, curtains. Um, don't ask me to, to be specific. My memory isn't that good. Um, and then it goes on, talks about uh, the Nazarite. And then it talks about the suspected wife, which is the Sota. And then it talks about the dedication. Uh, all the gifts that each one of the tribes brought, and it was a, it was all the same gift and variety. Uh, I, again, don't ask me to name it. You can look it up. It's uh, chapter seven of uh, Numbers, as we've now gotten to a new book. Uh, silver uh, silver and gold spoons, silver bowls with fine flour in it, etc. Um, so 
we also had the middle part, and this is the topic of our reading. So the Nazarite is, and uh, was somebody who didn't cut their hair, and they usually took this oath, this vow, for a specific period of time. The minimum amount of time was 30 days, and you could uh, replay, you could do it for 30 days and then decide I'm going to do it for another 30, or you could say, you know what, I'm going to do this for 90 days. And what being the, the vow of the Nazarite involved was, again, not cutting your hair for that period of time, abstaining from uh, any grape products and alcohol, and also um, not getting involved in uh, final care of somebody who died. So you're taking on those three extra commandments. Now, there's a little bit of a discussion among the sages. Some sages say, wow, how great that, you know, you feel this this, this love, this urge to go above and beyond because you want to give thanks. Maybe you just recovered from an illness and this is doing uh, a little bit extra, or maybe you just haven't felt the connection be between yourself and God. So now you kind of want to get back into it. And, um, you know, of course, you, there's an inauguration and once it's full, you shave your head, you bring a sin offering, a burn offering, and it, it's kind of a nice little ceremony. Uh, other sages say, look, you've got 613 commandments. Why on earth would you want another three? You know, isn't 613 enough? So you've got, well, as usual, you've got four and against in, uh, in the Talmud and the discussion. And there is, by the way, a whole tractate of the Nazarite. Now, you might have a spark of recognition here, and you might say, hmm, that kind of sounds familiar, and where's the familiarity? Well, one of our judges, and when we say judges, when we talk about judges in the biblical sense, we don't mean somebody that sits and in, in a court hearing and adjudicates, makes a decision, listens to the arguments here and there, and starts to, and works to resolve it. In Judaism, in, in our history, in, in the Israelite history, when we settled the land, the tribes were basically a loose confederation. Um, and this was basically kind of an opening for uh, uh, enemies to come in and say, oh, see, they're not united. We can defeat them pretty easily. Let's go in and, you know, and what a judge did, uh, and some of the notable judges were Gideon, uh, Jophbeth, and Deborah, a very famous judge. They would basically unite the tribes and they would help everybody get together and fight off the offenders. Well, Afterwards, unfortunately, sometimes they would just, you know, disperse and go back to their, you know, individual tribes. Some of them, even beyond the tribes, they were just into their clans, their extended family. So when it came time to fight the Philistines, God's like, you know, I'm just going to have Samson, who was, in, who was a lifelong Nazarite. His mother dedicated him to Nazarite, to Nazarite because she was barren and told, said to God, if you give me a son, I will dedicate him. And uh, Samson basically waged the guerrilla war against the Philistines. The other issue is the Sota, the um, suspected wife. A man sees his wife talking to some guy that, of course, he's, she's, they're not married to each other. And, you know, maybe she's smiling, he's smiling, he thinks, okay, there's something else is going on. So it is the only time in the Torah, the only time in our history, where we have a trial by ordeal, and it was actually done away with uh, Yochanan ben Zakkai, one of the high priests, uh, I believe he was an exilarch. He was kind of a priest during the um, exile between the two temples, uh, uh, or after the, I'm sorry, no, it was after the destruction of the second temple, when we had no temple, he said, there's no point in doing this anymore. So if a man, a man suspected his wife of cheating on him or being enticed by another man, he would bring her to the priests and the priest would pronounce a, it was actually a curse. And they would, uh, she would have a, uh, an offering, a mincha of, of coarse barley. Now, usually the offerings were fine wheat flour because they're offering to God, but this is different. So they would have, uh, because it's a, it's, it's a suspected person. So she would have the coarse barley flour that she would have an offering no oil, no frankincense to kind of spice it up. And they would take a parchment, write the curse on it, and then put it in this water, this bitter water, which also had dirt from the floor of the temple, and she would drink it. Well, 
if her stomach distended and her thigh got weak, then she was guilty and she would face a very unpleasant death. If, however, she was found innocent, that the water did absolutely nothing to her, then she was considered innocent. Uh, God promised that they would have a happy marriage and that she would give have, have, have a son. And no more were you to mention this. And it is the only time that God allows his name to be blotted out because the parchment was mixed in with, with the water and uh, his name and God's name Yudhe was on there, or that's what we assume. And, and, and it would be, it would dissolve in the water and she would drink it and everything would be fine. The only time that that's allowed. So that's our, that's our portion of the week. So what do these things have in common? Maybe the word is dedication. You know, it seems a little contrived, but you know, these things are put together for us to look at and think about. So as we leave you for this week, think about rededicating yourself to um, your heritage and your culture. Things aren't always great, but you know, we can work it out. Shabbat Shalom and thanks as usual for listening.